Welcome to The Buck Stops Here, the official podcast of NotInHallOfFame.com, and I'm your host, The Buck, Kirk Buckner, owner, operator of NotInHallOfFame.com, and of course its sister sites, the Fictitious Athlete Hall of Fame, the Fictitious Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's part seven of our series now, of looking at those who should really get another look at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and we're looking at former players today from the NFC East, and we've got, of course, Vinny Laspinuso, the wonder kid from uh, New York City, and he's going to help us to help us look at some of the players, the past Dallas Cowboys, Washington Redskins, Philadelphia Eagles, and the New York Giants. So without further ado, here's Vinny. <laughs> Vinny, it's so good to have you back. Uh, this, is, this was going to be a long one. We're looking at the NFC East, but I've put you on a two-minute warning now on each one. Not literally, but for... Uh, I, is it going to be hard? Because you're, only, you're only allowed six players per franchise. And these are some incredible franchises. Oh, yeah. You're looking at the NFC East. Easily the most profitable division in the NFL. Because if you look at the Forbes list, you would know that the Cowboys are easy number one. Giants are number three. Redskins are number five, I recall. And the Eagles are like nine or ten. So in the top ten most valuable NFL franchises, all of them have an NFC East team, and it also makes sense because the Cowboys are always appear on Sunday Night Football. They're always on prime time. You're always usually against an NFC East opponent, either the Eagles, the Giants, and even the Redskins. Um, you know, I would say that of all the divisions, the NFC East has the, probably the strongest rivalry uh, because, you know, you have the Cowboys have history with the Giants, Giants have history with the Eagles, the Eagles have history with the Redskins, the, the Redskins have history with the Cowboys. Every single one of the four teams has a history with one another. Now, in some cases, it could be bigger, like, you know, Cowboys and Redskins, and sometimes it might not be as big, let's say, Redskins and Eagles. But there is a very decently strong rivalry between mm -hmm. all these teams, especially considering the fact that, you know, say for the Cowboys, the NFC East has some very, very old uh, teams. Like, you're looking at a team like the Giants that was founded in 1925, the Redskins were founded in 1933. The Eagles, if I recall, were founded in like 1935 or 37. And the Cowboys were founded in 1960. So a lot of old teams. I'm not as old as the NFC North, which will now be in the final part. But really, really, all four of these teams, anyone, everyone agrees. Every single one of these four teams are an iconic franchise. You can't say that about, about that for any other division except for the NFC East. It's the only one in which every single team is an iconic franchise. Not very much so. And I'd say like even the one that is the least iconic right now is the one with the most recent Super Bowl ring, uh, that being the Eagles. Yeah, the Eagles, like they're one of those national, every single one of these teams you could argue is a national team. I mean, mm -hmm. easily the Cowboys are one. The Eagles have a very, very loud and vocal fan base. Mm -hmm. The Giants are very, very old and very, very you know historical destiny in New York. And for the Redskins, well, yes, may not be as much recent success, but man, the Redskins are a very iconic team. I mean, I would also say it helps when you have a uh, not too politically correct name, but that's another story for another time. Can, I yeah, for you to just say not too politically correct is almost an insult to not too politically correct. Uh, it, it is the worst name in all of sports. Sorry, Redskins fans who love that name. I, I hate it. I hated that as a kid, too. And, and I'm old. It always feels kind of weird, weird but I would mention that I'm not going to call – when we get to the Redskins, I'm not going to call them the Washington NFL football team because it sounds too – I don't know. It just doesn't sound right to me because it just sounds a little cocky, I guess you can say. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I, I know exactly what you're trying to say. But yeah. Like the Washington NFL team. Like the, no, just call them the Redskins, man. <laughs> did you know, the before we get into the into Dallas, which I know we'll do first because uh, we always do it alphabetically, that for a cup of coffee, uh, when, when the CFL tried uh, to have some American teams, so they got a team into Baltimore and uh, it was the Colts until they weren't allowed to use the Colts name anymore. And then... <laughs> They won, I believe, the Grey Cup. Well, they did win the Grey Cup, but I think it was as the Baltimore Football Club. Uh, that's interesting. And also, I would say that's pretty bland. It was very bland, and that what that experiment was one giant failure. But actually, that sort of 
that that actually, in a way, it set the CFL in the right motion. After that, they just said, screw it, we're just going to become a Canadian-only league, and we're just going to embrace everything Canada, and it's never been stronger than it is now. I would also say that, you know, it also kind of led to the Ravens coming. Well, that, that's that's exactly why it sort of ended mm-hmm. in Baltimore, because obviously, like, uh, Baltimore did, was the only CFL team that tried in the U.S. that actually drew. Everything else didn't. Mm. But, again, that's another story for another time. So uh, let's start off with Dallas. Uh, I, I, did you come up with six? Or I know you came up with six. You probably came up with 600. Who is your uh, most all-time cowboy? I think I know, but I, I want to see uh, what you come up with that you think should be in the Hall of Fame. Easily it's Quincy Carter. Obviously, <laughs> so, truly, truly an exceptional ca- talent. When he was chosen to succeed, Troy, when he was so true, oh, I'm just fucking you. It's Chuck Howley, of course. <laughs> That's what I thought you'd say. But nice swerve in uh, Quincy Carter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, Quincy Carter has no chance. But Chuck Howley, very different story. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, on your website, he is ranked as the number one. Number one. one. Number one. Yep. No one else higher. You can't get any higher than one. Chuck Howley is ranked as number one on your website. That is true. And, uh, he, and huge support from everyone who's voting. Oh, yeah. Like, I voted for him. I said, definitely put him in. And you're looking at a guy that is truly one of the most shocking players. Why is he not in the Hall of Fame? Well, I don't know why, but I can tell you one thing. Who? Okay. When you win Super Bowl MVP. Okay, you, you would assume, okay, it goes to someone that, you know, who wins, because that's how it's always been. Nay, nay. That has not always been the case, because there is one exception to this rule. Back in Super Bowl V, when the Colts defeated the Cowboys, the Super Bowl MVP award was given to a player on the losing team. And that player just so happened to be Chuck Howley. He was also the very first player that was not a quarterback to win the award. I mean, that's that's something. I mean, that's not something you can just shy away from and just say, oh, he was on a losing team. Uh, who cares? No, that's pretty special. Also, yeah, like, he he's on a very long list, and he's near the very, very top of, Great linebackers not in the Hall of Fame. And, you know, it shows. Like, he's a six-time pro bowler, a five-time first-team all-pro, and a second-team all-pro. Well, technically, that's seven pro bowls because one of them he got first-team all-pro but didn't make the pro bowl for some reason. But, yeah, Tom Landry, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said that he was basically saying how Tom Landry was one of the most dynamic players he ever coached. I mean... Pretty, uh, I'd say that's a pretty uh, strong uh, uh, case from Tom Landry to say that he's deserving. Absolutely. I mean, you got to look at who's endorsing you, too. And when it's coming from someone like Landry, that carries a lot of weight. Yeah. Also, um, I mean, it just comes to the fact that he is really one of the greatest covers linebackers of all time. Like, he also intercepted 25 passes, and that also got two touchdowns out of there. In fact, he was so good as an athletic linebacker that he finished with more than 100 yards in interception returns in both 68 and 71. And, you know, he also had a lot of sacks, but we don't really... It was yeah. Roughly 26 and a half, which is a lot considering the, he was a linebacker at that time, but... Mm-hmm. um. I don't know, like, he also has the longest return for a fumble in team history, 97 yards. Like, incredible player. Yeah. Uh, why he's been kept out, I don't know. Uh, perhaps that's going to change with a 20-member class, which... Uh, but we'll I don't see. know, man. Uh, that looks kind of unlikely for Chuck Howley, because it seems like, except for, like, maybe just a couple guys, the seniors, they're going to be focusing on the guys that made all Zeki teams that are in which is completely fair, which is completely fine. 
because there's two uh, because there's two Cowboys in the 1970s All Decade Team. The only two uh, first team, the only two first team members of the 70s All Decade Team that are not in, and it just so happened to both be Cowboys. And I kind of li- linked them together here because they seem to have an equal shot at making it. Um, even though that you know Howie's deserving, absolutely, I would say maybe a little bit more deserving. But I would say that. From everything I can tell, it looks like, you know, Pearson and Harris, Drew Pearson and Cliff Harris are mm-hmm. both more or less Duck Alley. Now, does that mean they're more deserving? Mm, it's debatable, but I would say that it makes sense to focus on, you know, the, the people that are on the all-decade team, let alone first team all-decade. I think Drew Pearson has an excellent shot. Oh, I think Drew Pearson is a very, very um legitimate shot like i know that you know i remember that 2017 nfl draft where he came up and he just mercifully just trolled eagles fans <laughs> and that some voters were actually commenting and saying you know this might be the wake-up call for drew pearson and and i agree i think that really made people aware of drew pearson like oh yeah drew pearson he was pretty good <laughs> and like Man, like he he was a truly, truly good player. Like, I mean, you're the only, if you're the only member on the offensive side of the ball on the 1970s All Ducky team, first team, the only guy that is not in. You don't think there should be any questions about that? I, I think I, he would, do, I agree with you. I think he's got a better shot than than Howley. I don't know that he should, but he does. Well, that doesn't mean they're not deserving. I because I think they're both deserving, but I think the reason as to why um, Pearson has a likelier shot than Howie, again, if you're first team all decade and if you're not in, let alone the only first team all decade on the offensive side of the ball, yes, obviously there's a major issue there. And I completely support uh, Drew Pearson. Now, granted, I will admit that when it comes to wide receivers in that area, that's not the guy you hear the most from fans. That being Cliff Branch, who unfortunately died during a Hall of Fame induction ceremony. And yeah, mm-hmm. it was a funny hearing that from Raiders fans that entire night. Like, come on, guys. You want this is your perfect time to trash it, I, I guess. But, man. But, yeah, Drew Pearson. I mean, Drew Pearson had something that Cliff Branch is not. An all-decade team on it. He was a very clutch performer. Like, you know the Hail Mary against the Vikings? Mm-hmm. Who caught the ball? That would uh, not. That was not Quincy Carter. Well, Quincy Carter couldn't have, couldn't catch. Well, then he also couldn't throw. But <laughs> it was Drew Pearson. Drew Pearson. Yeah, Drew Pearson. I mean, when now the team was always very very consistent, but the thing about Pearson that really holds him up is the fact that he was always there for the most part, and he only missed three games. Only three games. Now, one could say, oh, was he truly that good? He was only a, a four-time All-Pro, three-time Pro Bowler. Now, again, that's a de facto four-time Pro Bowler. He could have played a little bit longer, but it wasn't his decision uh, to retire. Um, yeah, he played for 11 seasons. However, his career was, if I recall, his career was cut short because of a uh, – Car accident. Yeah, I'm not. I can't recall exactly why. Uh, so Cliff Harris, uh, he's your third guy, and another excellent choice. Uh, Somebody oh, yeah. who could, who, who could Again, uh, like get a look. Just like Chris, just like Drew Pearson, the only member on the '70s All Ducky Team first team that is not in on the defensive side. So you're having a very, very similar situation with Pearson and Harris, like literally the exact same situation. They're both Cowboys both from the Landry era, both excellent during the 70s, both iconic players, mm-hmm. and also they're both in two positions that people have been demanding get more respect at wide receiver and safety. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, safety, it's, safety's certainly gotten a lot better than it used to be, that's for sure. You know, wide receiver, people are like screaming at their high horse to get more wide receivers in because they want more wide receivers in. Now I would, you know, I wouldn't just focus on just the numbers. I would also, you know, keep in mind the guys that played before the merger era. But I would also look at these guys as well. 
But, you know, going with Cliff Harris, I would honestly say that he is, he's probably even more deserving because unlike Pearson, nothing against Pearson, but Harris has something that Pearson doesn't. He's been a finalist one. Yeah, that's true. So, he, he was a finalist. I'm trying to remember which year that was. Uh, 2004. Mm-hmm. Also, just like Drew Pearson, their careers were kind of short. I mean, not like really short. Like, and they're not like short careers like, you know, a guy like, say, Terrell Davis or Penny Easley. No, a little bit longer than that, but they uh, retired. Uh, Pearson was good, but I would say Harris was an even better choice. Well, they're kind of neck and neck for me. But Harris was a six-time Pro Bowler and a five-time All-Pro. So that's a pretty good case in itself. And the fact that he has more All-Pros could definitely help him out a little bit more than uh, Drew Pearson. Also, I see some people predicting that Harris would get in instead of Drew Pearson, but I'm not too sure. But yeah. During his career, he um, intercepted 29 passes and had 18 fumble recoveries as a safety. And, you know, when he was the first-team All-Pro, he was the consensus first-team All-Pro. Mm-hmm. True. The reason why he ended his career a little bit uh, early, even though he was excelling at a high level, he was still a pro Bowl in his final season, was because he wanted to just work in the oil business. Well, now you're seeing more people deciding to... Now you're seeing more people deciding to like, you know, hang up like Rob Gronkowski and Andrew Luck, which, like, my thoughts on that. But um, Cliff Harris, I would say, might be even more deserving than Drew Pearson because there's something called the Cliff Harris Award. Yes, they, there's a award named after Cliff Harris. If you don't know what the Cliff Harris Award is, it's an award that's presented from the top defensive player in the country representing Division Two, Three, and the NA1IA colleges and universities. I mean... I actually, I did, I didn't know that. I did, <laughs> but yeah, if you if you're good enough to have an award named after you, I mean, granted, especially the, granted, that's maybe. that's in college. Yes, but granted, there's many great legendary Hall of Famers that you know have an award, like the Jim Brown Award, or let's say, um, I'm gonna think of it as like the Jim Brown, but the other ones are not in my head, but. You know, if, if your name, if your name, if your if an award is named after you, I would say that's pretty impactful. Right, but I just want to again stress that that was on the college level. Uh, like the biggest sort of a, like in in pro baseball, for example, there was the Edgar Martinez Award for the best DH, but they named that award after Martinez after after year after year not electing him into the Hall of Fame. Just find that mind blowing. It took ten years for it to happen. But that's an, yeah. I, that's another uh, one of my many tangents. So it's up to me to keep everything on course. Cowboy number four is. Uh, why don't we go for the guy that was elected that was chosen as a finalist, seemingly out of nowhere, just a couple of years ago? Mm-hmm. Everson Walt. That was a surprise, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was a surprising choice because he never was a semifinalist until his final year of eligibility, where he did not only just make it as a semifinalist. But he made it as a full-blown finalist in the 2000, in 2018. Now, granted, him and Joe Jacoby, who I will mention a little bit later down, both, unfortunately, did not make it out of the top 15. But I would definitely say that the fact that in his final year, he made it as a finalist, in his final year, I personally think that, wow, it really, like, sends shockwaves. Like, saying, man, Everson Waltz, he was pretty dominant for his career and. Like, you know, you had Ed Reed make the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. And what is interesting about Ed Reed is that he led the league in interceptions three times. But he was not the first guy to do that. The only other guy to ever lead the lead in interceptions three times was Everson Walt. And, it, and there's definitely a case there. It's just... Uh... The Pro Football Hall of Fame usually never does that, though. Whenever... If someone's going to... They've got to almost pay their dues in the in toil as a semifinalist for years. They don't just jump right from, I don't want to call it obscurity because that's not the right word, but just from no consideration to a finalist. That just doesn't happen. 
No, it just does not happen. What do you think this means for his chances going forward? I mean, I don't think he's going to make it for the next several years, but I think this helps him out. It has Why to. It, it ha- well, it moves, it moves the needle in the right direction for him. Because now he can at least say, well, I was a finalist. You considered me at this point. What's changed? I'm more so like amazed at how m- you. I never saw anything like this, and there might have been once, but I never saw a situation with someone like just preliminary, preliminary for so many years, and then his final year, his very last year of modern eligibility, he becomes a finalist just out of nowhere. It seems, and I was kind of falling for him a little bit. Like no, that'd be pretty cool if he actually did because, and obviously he did not make it, but you know, I still thought that meant a lot of good things for the future for Everson Walls. And yeah, I'm focused on the interception, but. You know, like we all know about the the catch and who was right behind uh, Dwight Clark. Well, it was Everson Walls. He still caught two interceptions in that game. <laughs> Even though they lost, he, it's not like he was terrible in that game. He was really, really dominant. People forget that. You just reminded me of that too. That's something I forgot. All right, Cowboy number yeah. five. Oh, uh, Cowboy number five. Um, I have a Harvey Martin on this one. Yep, I was I was hoping he'd come up. Yeah, Harvey Martin. Um, well, Randy White, as you know, uh, won Super Bowl MVP mm-hmm. in Super Bowl um, twelve. However, he did not he did not take that award by himself, as there was a co MVP along with him. Uh, that was Harvey Martin, the defensive end. Now, obviously. He's a little bit down, but he's also on the all the seventies all decade team. Now, granted, it's second team, but he is still on the all decade team of the West. Yep, and that matters. It it matters totally. Oh yeah, it absolutely matters. Now, granted, do I think he's going to make it before you know the the trio and even Walls? No, but I don't think it's a bad thing. I think this could just like you know if you're getting this guy in, then the next guy, the next right. guy, right? Like. And, and, you know, it's not like Harvey Martin was just, like, you know, inferior. Now, yeah, obviously, three of his all three of his four all pros were second team. But he did win Defensive Player of the Year in mm-hmm. his, in 1977. So it's not like he doesn't have anything going for him besides the MVP. No, he won Defensive Player of the Year in, in 77. I mean, when you win Defensive Player of the Year or Offensive Player of the Year, if you have a lot of other stuff as well, it usually helps you out in the long run. Absolutely. I mean, it's a it's when you're t- when you're telling it when you're telling the world that this guy was the best person on this side of the ball for a one year period of time. How does that not mean something? It means a lot. I mean, him as a defensive end, the Cowboys led the NFL in the fewest rushing yards allowed um, in like '78, and, and, and he also had 12 sacks in 1980, the sixth best in the league. I mean. And also, in postseason, he, now obviously, sat, uh, sacks weren't official on stats during the time, but he had 17 and a half sacks in 22 postseason games. If I recall, that's the most. Now, people will say, oh, Willie McGinnis has the most. Yeah, but that was also when sacks were an official statistic. Back then, sacks were not an official statistic. So, if you put this in perspective, Harvey Martin, I mean, and also four fumble recoveries, in the playoffs and seventeen and a half sacks. I mean, hey, throw in the fact that he's all, the, all of that, and he's a WrestleMania participant. There you go. Oh yeah, I think I've heard a little bit about that. Yeah, um, in the WrestleMania two battle royal, he was in it, where they had six so football I, players. Well, I would say what's going to hurt him compared to the other uh, four guys that I just mentioned is that uh, he's uh, he, he died. Uh, he died in two thousand one. So that's in my in my hurt a bit, but I don't know because a guy like Buck Branch died, and now more Raiders fans want him in. But it could hurt a little bit. It might not make people think of him as much. Though I would say it helps when Gil Brandt, when he's saying all these great players that should be deserving for the Hall of Fame, when he mentions your name and a bunch mm-hmm. of other Cowboys, like no, I'm not going to mention their name in full, but like Cornell Green and Ralph Neely and Neory Jordan. Mm-hmm. I mean. Your guy like Cliff Branch, who is literally an encyclopedia of knowledge, and he's also going to be voting in the 2020 uh, Blue Ribbon Committee, which I'm so happy for him. 
because he, he is a genius, that guy. Um, True Innovator. But, oh, yeah, truly. Really, um, then who could my final Cowboy be? Um, I don't know. I, I like you, you pretty much went five for five in what I thought you would do. And like, and I would mention like Johnson and Johnson and Merchant, but I'm going to leave that for the um, the whole uh, you know the website. But yep. uh, okay. I could have mentioned Witten Smith or Martin, but you know the, the, uh, Witten Smith or Martin, be, but they're already active. And you know, where's going to be the first uh, first out slam dunk? Hmm. It, should I mention? Uh, you know the guy on CBS. Should I mention uh, the, the semifinals the last few years? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with. Uh, I'm gonna go with the, the latter. I'm gonna go with Darren Woodson. Okay. Yep. Good choice. Yeah, Darren Woodson. Like as as for the six Cowboys, he uh, out of the six, he is my final of the six. I I'll mention uh, the other guy when we get to the uh, two Eagles quarterbacks, but. You know, Darren Woodson, he, like, when you think of those those very dominant 90s Cowboys that won three Super Bowls in four years, the guy that was platooning that secondary was Darren Woodson. And, you know, it shows that he's been a semifinalist the last, uh, three of the last five years. Now, when do I see him making it as a finalist? It's not going to happen until Paul Mull makes it, and mm-hmm. Atwater makes it. And maybe even Lynch makes it, or even if Butler makes it. So it's 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 gonna be a it's gonna be a tough road for Darren Woodson, but I think he will eventually become a finalist. Now, what did Darren Woodson do for his career? Well, I can just tell you right now what he did for his career. He was a five time Pro Bowl and a four time first team All Pro, and he was with the Cowboys from ninety two to oh four. It's a pretty stellar career. Although I could I should mention that you know he has not been on the all decade team of the nineties. But then again, the two guys that are Leroy Butler and Steve Atwater are in the, aren't in the hall of fame yet. So I don't know if it's going to really affect it that much, but, um, yeah, I mean, if I recall, the only defensive player in the, on those fantastic Cowboys teams was, you know, Charles Haley, who was also a uh, 49er, uh, Deion Sanders, who was also a Falcon. And that's really it. Um, if you want to have a third one, I mean, Haley and Sanders, you can make a case for, but those two were not really pure blooded Cowboys. If you want to look for a pure blooded Cowboy, it's Darren Woodson. He's been, he was the Cowboys his entire career. In fact, he was the final focal point of those great Cowboys teams that lasted on the roster. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. Last mm-hmm. survivor of that. And those teams were just so good. Like there's just no weaknesses on either side of the ball. I mean, he held authority in that secondary. He had a he had a very very rare ability to both run and pass. I mean, Jimmy Johnson had a lot of lot of like you know strong praise for him. Like, I would definitely say that many people consider that Darren Woodson, out of anyone else from the team, was arguably the most versatile player on the whole roster because you could put him in, put him anywhere. Just an incredible player. Just brings yeah, back so well, just brings well, back I, so many memories when you just bring that name up, watching him play. Yeah, I'd say that's a pretty good six. I would. <laughs> that's I would, an incredible six. And let's see if we can. T- real- oh, I'm wondering if we if uh, we're gonna have a better six. Well, you already know whether that's gonna be the case or not. Uh, so here's you now. Now let's go to your hometown, the New yeah. York Giants, the G-Men. Mm-hmm. Who's your number one? Both my Giants. Uh, it may seem like an oddball, but in, it might not actually be that much of an eyeball if you really think about it. Now, who is the NFL's biggest rival? To the Giants? No, no think about it for a second. Who is, it, who is Roger Goodell's biggest rival? Intelligence. No, 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 no. Who is his biggest rival when it comes to... Ethics. Strike? Who is the league office's biggest rival? Tom Brady. No. How about the Players Association? Okay, so where are we going with this? Who founded the Players Association? I don't even know. Who? Kyle Rhodes. Oh, okay. All right. 
Oh, so yeah, uh, four-time Pro Bowler of the fifties. That's your first one. Okay, big part of yeah. the big part of that team. He didn't. I actually I like this choice because he wasn't like a statistical marvel, but he totally reinvented himself after getting his knee uh, clip or not clip, but hurting his knee, and then be, turning into one of the best wide wideouts of the fifties. That's a that's a great choice. I like it. Yeah, I mean he he was a really dominant player. I mean he was a two-time All Pro and a four-time uh, Pro Bowler. He's a really dominant player now. Granted, one of those all pros is when he wasn't a pro bowler, so a technically five-time pro bowler. That's what I consider it. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you look at Kyle Rhodes, he was a great halfback back in college, and you know, even though that the injuries kind of forced him to become one of their became their receiver, he became their top receiver right. during the fifties, yeah. and he caught three hundred passes. I mean. That, that's pretty good, I would say. Yeah, and they were champions in 56. Uh, they were the finalists, I think, two years after that, if I remember correctly. So the, the, the <laughs> Giants of the last half of the 50s were very, very good. He was also, you know, he was the captain of the team, too. I, yes, I think for more than half his career. Yeah, this, that's, a, know, that's an excellent yeah, first choice. I like it. And, you know, he was the guy... That led to the NFL Players Association. He wanted equal opportunities for every single player. Didn't matter if you were a, a legend or if you were the third string punter. That it, he wanted equal opportunities for everyone. How, and he how, also became how, their first ever elected president. How bad a team must be if they've got a third string punter? Just an expression. Yeah, I know. I'm just being a dick here. Okay, no, no but I, hey, I like but, it. you know. That's a, it's a really, really strong. Chance. Yeah, it might be a bit more of an under under radar guy because he never was an all a decade team guy. But listen, if you're the captain of a team that was very, very competitive in the pre merger era, mm-hmm. and if you were the guy, that is the re- that's the reason as to why the players' association is a thing. I mean. That's going to help you. It'll help you out in your favor a little bit, I would think. Yeah, even though uh, we talk about how strong the requirement is to get into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, there there is a lot of intangibles to this resume. I like it. Yeah, I, I, mean, I really like that one. It's a really, really, it's a very unique choice. Like obviously, you'd be, obviously you'd be inducted as a player, but what's really going to help him out is the fact that he was just. Forced for mm-hmm. player rights, like it, 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 it sounds like a bit of a political choice, but it really does show that you know the, the players matter. And I think a great way to show that is if you put in Kyle Rose. I think that would just be a home run decision. That would be a grand slam choice mm-hmm. okay. under the radar, but yeah, really dominant. No, like, that, I, that, I, I love it. I, I, I love it. Uh, I can really get behind that one. Uh, you're number two. Uh, I have uh, one of the favorite players um, that my uh, grandfather liked, and if I recall, he's actually the oldest all-decade team guy that's not in the Hall of Fame, Del Schaffner. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. Now, obviously, for me, he's not as strong of a case as Kyle Rowe, because, well, Schaffner didn't create the player association, but I'm not going to hold that against him for obvious reasons, because there can only be one guy that creates the player association, well, it was multiple, but he was the one that was leading it. But for Schaffner, he was one of the more dominant players in the 1960s. Um, looking him up right now. Do, 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 do. Um, he also played for the Rams earlier in his career. Um, yeah, right here. Uh, with Schaffner. Sorry, just. No, no, it's, no, it's, no take your time. No, Sha- yeah. Sh- Sha- yeah, Sha- another right. all decade guy. Was, yeah, very good player. Yeah. He was the first team all pro. Not only was he first team all pro. He was five-time first team all-pro, and also every single time that he was an all-pro, he was unanimous. Mm-hmm. And he then, was a yeah. all-pro. He was a man. Jeez, how many receivers could you say was all-pro? And every single time that you made it, it was unanimous. I can't think of one. Exactly. There you go. Um. He was um, so dominant, the fact that he led the league in receiving yards in 58. He finished second in the category in 59 and 61. And when he retired, he finished, se- and he- and then in 62, he finished second in receiving yards with 12. And also, in 1963, his total of 1,181 was his career best. 
and it was also the third highest of the NFL that season. I mean, however, why did why was his career only like eleven seasons? Well, it's because of illnesses, and he retired after nineteen sixty seven. So that's kind of why he sort of declined after sixty three. Yeah, these, but, these are uh, two really two really unique ones. I like them. Uh, I can't wait to see Giant number three. Yeah, Giant number three is it, a little bit of an oddball kind of one, but one that actually does make a little bit of sense. Okay. Uh, Charlie Connerly. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, former quarterback, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, he was a quarterback. Um, Connerly, I'm sorry, I'm just like, um, another thing. Charlie Con- Connerly, now, that's not going to be the, the quarterback that my dad's going to can't demand for, but he's the one that I see more people talk about because, well, it may not seem as good with, you know, he won an MVP, but he was also a one-time All-Pro, um, three-time, two-time, technically three-time um, Pro Bowl, and he won the NFL championship. So, And he also had, is never retired by the Giants. So, yeah, I would definitely say that someone like Connolly is an interesting kind of case. Would he come before, you know, Road or Schaffner? Obviously not, but or even a guy like or even a guy like Ken Anderson or Roman Gabriel, no. But, you know, he did lead the NFL he did lead the team to the championship in fifty six. And from my understanding I don't know, like he also was the Marlboro man, um, in commercials. Wait well, seriously? Yes, serious. After, yes, he was he was the Marlboro man. Man, I I'm I'm so conflicted. I mean, I always think of that as like one of the coolest sort of like uh, looks. Yet at the same time, you're promoting cigarettes. Well, also Stan Darnold's uh, grandfather, or like his great grandfather, also was one that's Marlboro man. But what makes it better is that his his uh, his name was Dick Hammer. What? Dead theory. Search up um, Sam Darnold, and you'll find a Dick Hammer. That's that's it. Man, it's it's it, it's uh. <laughs> that, incidentally, that was um that was Michael Vick's uh, first idea to sort of like uh, get his uh, anti STD medicine. It was either Dick Hammer or Ron Mexico. He went with the latter. I like Ron Mexico. Do you know NFL.com got flooded with uh. Requests for Falcons jerseys with Mexico in the background, and they just filled it for the first couple days until they found out why. And so they put a stop on it. You're not, you cannot buy a Ron Mexico jersey at NFL.com. Yeah, but you know what? what I think Connerly hasn't going for him. Imagine being a finalist seven times and not being in. That's huge. That's, that's, I mean, it's not as much as a guy like, let's say, Bob Kuschenberg, where <laughs> you're a finalist nine times and you're still not in, but Seven times. And he just that's passed away, than too, Kuchenberg. That's more than Lester Hayes. That's more than a lot of players. Hell, that's even more than Ken Anderson, who I think was a finalist twice. But the fact he was a finalist seven times, I mean, what's taking you so long, guys? Very good question. All right, giant number four. Uh, I'm going to mention this guy's name because, you know, my dad's been demanding him for a bit. Um, the quarterback that he really wants is Bill Sims. Bill Sims was, I'm, I'm assuming, and this is going to make me depressed, that I'm closer to your dad's age, obviously, than you. I've watched a lot of Bill Sims games, and he, is, you know, he's got the Super Bowl ring. He was in that top, I, he was sort of in that top five to ten category for many times. I don't know that he was ever necessarily the best quarterback in the league. I think he was a former MVP at one point. But, yeah, he actually was. He was. The, yeah. Uh, the news, the newspaper enterprise association. It, it's not around anymore. They don't do the award anymore. But um, that's what I recall. Um, no, no, the NAA is still around, but they don't do the vote anymore. But Phil Sims won in 1986, which just so happened to be the, the year where he won Super Bowl MVP, and he said that he was going to Disneyland. And he's a, he's an All Pro in '86. He was a two-time Pro Bowl, and it should be a three. And you know, many people consider him as the best quarterback in Giants franchise history. Well, I would disagree with that. Um, but, you know, people say, you know, look at Troy Aikman and look at Phil Sims. You'll see that Sims has, you know, more touchdowns than Troy Aikman. Now, the difference is that Troy Aikman was, you know, three Super Bowls. You can't really ignore that. But one thing that people are still going to mention is how, you know, Sims, 
if Sims was a quarterback when the Giants was the Super Bowl 25, he would have won it for them. Probably a bigger, wider margin than a Jeff Hosteller. Right, right, yeah. And I remember That's- watching that, too. It's uh, Sims is a very good choice. Uh, never got a whole lot of uh, push, despite remaining in the public eye, because he's still a broadcaster, I believe. Uh, I think doing the pre-show is it and is it NBC, CBS? I forget which one. Uh, CBS. Now, CBS. Okay. He doesn't, do, he doesn't do it anymore with like the, the main one because Tony Romo is taking that over. But what I don't understand is that you get all these people that say, "Oh, you got in because of the media gun." Like I had this part with this one guy that would keep telling me that. Yo, Brant's in because of the media. I said, okay, then explain to me why all these other guys are not in, and they've been in the media arguably even longer than Phil Simms. Not in the neck of Phil Simms, like Yo, Brant. And I don't know, you can't reason with those people, but what I say is if the media truly helped them out along the way, then how come a guy like Phil Simms isn't in yet? How come a guy like Steve Tasker isn't in yet? I mean, just because you're a member of the media doesn't mean you're going to get in. I mean, this is in baseball. Where yeah, exactly. In baseball, that does happen. That's how Phil Rizzuto got in. I mean, and, he, he, and he has no business being in the Baseball Hall of Fame. I mean, the Football Hall of Fame, does, they don't have that same thing that, you know, baseball does. Um, but for football, people seem to think that's the case, but it objectively isn't. From every single indication, that's not the case. Because... Well, if that was the case, then explains to me why Phil Simms is not in the Hall of Fame. And, and he's been doing, calling Super Bowls, he's been calling major playoff games for many, 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 many years. So, yeah, I would say that uh, that claim is total BS. <laughs> no argument here. All right, giant number five. Uh, giant number five. Hmm. There is a. Uh, how does this sound? Uh, hmm. Jimmy Patton. Yeah. Sounds very good. Uh, Jimmy Patton is a guy that has been on my radar a bit, obviously, compared to other Giants, not as much. But, you know, something has to be said for a guy that was, you know, he was a safety. And surprisingly, he was not um, on the old decade for the 70s, but, you know, Eddie Meter was on there, but that's okay. Um, because Eddie Meter was better, but... Jimmy Patton, he was a five-time first-team All-Pro, and he was also a second-team All-Pro, so technically a six-time Pro Bowler. He led the league in interceptions in '58, so that was a pretty that's a pretty good resume. By all indications, that would mean that you know, he would be in if he was blocked today. He he would probably be in the first few years, but uh, unfortunately, because the voting system was very very corrupt back then. It's, why a guy like Jimmy Patton uh, didn't get in. That's why, you know, I've been advocating for a lot of these older guys because the voters now would be far more accepting to an increase as opposed to the stingy old guys. But, yeah, for Jimmy Patton, the team, the Giants team had six conference titles and 52 career interceptions. I said that's pretty good. Well, it's excellent. I mean, yeah, I mean, if I'm looking at, like, you know, the interceptions leader right now, I mean, granted, that may not be top five, but, um, hmm. Yeah, but there, it's st- still anyone who's gotten 50, inter- even 40 interceptions, it, it's one hell of a career. Oh, yeah, absolutely just very, very just, absolutely just dominant, just dominant player. When you, Especially when you get above 50. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's got to at least say something. Oh, for, and it's so and it's so hard for for these great uh, se- great players in the secondary to, to even get a, sometimes even just get a couple interceptions in a season. No one wants to target them. And this was also a time in which interceptions were not as common. Right. Ab- absolutely, because we didn't have the same air game. Mm-hmm. Very true. All right, I, I can't. Who's bachelor number six for the G Men? I, I can't wait here because I've loved this so far. I- I have a feeling, though, I'm not going to like this one. I don't know why. I just have a feeling. Uh, well, I'm I'm going to break the rule a little bit here because this is easily one of the, when it comes to discussions about this guy, it's arguably one of the most hostile hall conversations. Oh, I already know it. I love it. All right, go on. My boy Eli. Uh, uh, no. 
in my mind, he's not a Hall of Famer, but he's going to get talked about. Two Super Bowls. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, how do I feel about Eli Manning? How do you feel about Eli Manning? Um, now, um, this is what I say. One of the most discussed players on the internet for Hall of Fame consideration is Jim Plunkett. But yet, whenever someone mentions Eli Manning, it's meant with absolute vitriol without even question. I mean, I would assume that, you know, Eli Manning better than Jim Plunkett. I would agree. Uh, I would agree. Uh, Plunkett wouldn't even make my top 300, which is what I, which is what it's building up to, by the way. But, yeah, I, I, I'm in a complete agreement. Mm-hmm. I, I would, and also, um, people keep mentioning the interceptions and, of course, you know, smearing guys like Joe Namath and these other guys in the process, just smearing the name without any context because they're just so stupid. And, though I would mention this, with Eli Manning, how many players could say they won two Super Bowl MVPs? Very how many few. players could say they also won Walter Payton Man of the Year? Also, you know, he also leads. How many players could say they, no matter what happened, you were always the starting quarterback? Unless Bob Ben McAdoo comes and Geno Smith is starting. I mean, I understand that he, was an, he plays an era in which it's easier for the quarterback to stay healthy, but the fact that he has the most, 210 consecutive starts, and then Van McAdoo comes in. Just really think about that. 230-plus consecutive starts, if you really think about it. Just forget about the Geno Smith. I don't think anyone's going to hold that against him. The fact that he is an Iron Man, no matter what happens, no matter if he gets hit, no matter if he gets popped, no matter if he has an interception, or if he has a weird face that he has, he's always there. He is always the starting quarterback. No matter what happens, he always gets up. That's what mm-hmm. I, that I think is going to help him out a lot. The fact that, yes, he plays an error in which, you know, quarterbacks tend to be, you know, tend to be healthy uh, okay. a lot longer. But okay. the fact but, that he most. He, he, but as for what I think of him. Yeah, that's what I want to know. Really and, you know, the fact that he, yes, he won the two Super Bowls, but, you know, and all the other times that, you know, his teams went to the playoffs, they were one and done. But you can't ignore the fact that, oh, just brush away, the fact that, you know, he's, the fact that he won those two Super Bowls as, you know, they had to win four games in a row to do it. And, yes, he was on some flawed teams, but, you know, I, I just would not hold that against him. You you but, can you can get the argument against him though, right? Yes, I completely understand the argument against. Him. They mentioned the interceptions, which I can understand a little bit about it. But again, Brett Favre has all the interceptions. Does yeah, that but mean Brett Favre no. was the better gunslinger? Oh yeah, he was definitely yeah, better. Gunslinger. Yeah, and yes. and and as for Favre, I've said for I I have said for years that he's the most he was the most overrated quarterback because he was also so uh, interception prone. You know, Brett Favre was actually my favorite quarterback growing up. I didn't say I disliked him. I just said he was overrated. No, I just said that, you know, I was just saying that he was my uh, he was my most yeah. one. And the fact that, you know, I completely understand the argument against Eli, but I would say just, like, the fact that just the vitriol that just comes when anyone even discusses Eli's name, I think that's pretty disheartening. And I think that shows that, you know, they're not willing to compromise over anything. Well, him, him and Donovan McNabb can start a support group. Oh, yeah. Like, but what's interesting is how, like, you know, if Eli gets in, you're going to see a lot of demand from McNabb, which I'm going to talk to. But I didn't mention this guy's name before, but I think if Eli has a big chance, you're going to see a very, very large push for Tony Romo. And uh, many people yeah. argue that Tony uh, Romo was a better quarterback. In some ways, he, he, he might have been. Uh Eli, though, I mean, if he does that, he's got to thank uh, David Tyree's helmet. And also Murray Manningham. Yeah, that too. That too. Yeah, but I, I know that, you know, if Eli has a – then you're going to see a lot of people that really, really want Tony Romo. Mm-hmm. Because if anything, there seems to be more support for Tony Romo getting to the Hall of Fame than there is Eli Manning from a fan perspective. As for me, I think Eli is going to make the Hall of Fame. Romo, I think it has to come from the fans. Well, I think the fans. Yeah, be I, I think you're right. It, but. Uh, I'll, I'm going to do one last word on Eli. Uh, sort of 
as much as I don't know that I would necessarily vote him in, when it comes to quarterback discussion in the NFL, and the only position that they really talk about that, if you hold someone against for not winning a Super Bowl, then the same rule applies for Manning winning it, winning two. Oh, not only that, he he was the leader of a team that beat the most dominant team in the NFL the last 20 years twice. That's true. That's going to help him a lot. That is going to help him a lot. But I definitely can tell you that, you know, people on the, people in just general, they seem to want, you know, they want Tony Romo more. Um, yeah, that won't happen. happen. That won't happen. I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like, you know, once Eli gets in, I feel like he's going to get a massive shitstorm from a lot of people. Um, because I don't know if it's going to be a good PR. I don't know no. if it's going to be good PR from many people's perspective, and they're just going to demand Romo a lot more, and maybe even the other guy that I'm going to mention when I get the Eagles a lot more. Well, but, yeah, I, I, I well, let's, let's segue into that. It's Eagle time now. We, we got your six. Yeah, I got, I got my six, and you know, it just kind of ties in. But before we get to those two, why don't we talk about one of the five players that the PFRA officially supports? Uh, the, Al Weister. Weister. Uh, uh, just no, just I, I was waiting for you to do your usual. You changed up your verbiage, your verbiage. You yeah, always, you always, you, you, you always do that of, hall of very good. Uh, you got to do that. So don't worry, because he was actually the very first class of hall of very good. <laughs> there, that's what I wanted to hear, buddy. I wanted to hear that that sort of disdain when you say all that. But yeah, they're right. There's like four. Yeah, there's four that they officially endorse. Uh, he's one of them. Uh, so there's a lot of people who don't know too much about Wizard. Oh, what? I don't know if it's Wizard, Wizard, but man, he was good. Imagine being so good that from the way it looks like on the uh, on the 2020 uh, Blue Ribbon panel, there are two players that, from what I can understand, are locks. Duke Slater, my most wanted player. And Al Weister. Like, you know, you realize how big you have to be, or Ock is the nickname, but his name is Al. Um, how was he as a player? Oh, he was great. He really was a phenomenal player. He was an eight-time All-Pro. Eight-time All-Pro. Eight times. Huge amount. Massive amount. And, um... Yeah, he's won the, the very first list that the CFR ever did for the Hall of Very Good. Weister was on there. They could have chosen anyone, but Weister was one of the very first guys they ever endorsed. It's up and Kramer was one of the first guys. Johnny Robinson was one of the first guys. Benny, man, a lot. Benny Freeman was one of the first guys they endorsed. And Al Weister was in that same exact, he, he was on that as well, like, Man, that, that just speaks volumes for mm-hmm. how just how much, like you know, how deserving a guy like Weister is. Now, exactly the question that people could have is, okay, how was Al Weister as a player besides the eight-time All Pro? Well, he led the Eagles line in NFL championship years from '48 to '49. Um, you also look at Al Weister, um, looking at like a lot of the testimonials. Um, George Allen, you know, phenomenal Hall of Fame head coach from the Redskins, the Rams. He listed him as one of the 100 best pro players of all time. And he also selected him as one of the top 10 best defensive linemen of all time. And he said that Astro always played in the perfect position and was seldom off his feet. He was superb pursuit of a man and seemed somehow to get in on every single play. He was sure a tackler and he was maybe best against the run, but he was among the very good early pass rushers. And he also said that had an offensive lineman because, you know, back then they, the, the, the linemen both played offense and defense. And as an offensive lineman, he said that he was a fine blocker as you could want. He did have the size to overpower people to pass block, but he was a master in every kind of block. Now, he was only 200, 217 pounds when you see a lineman they generally are a lot bigger. And also, in the hitting game of football, football historians Bob Carroll, Pete Palmer, and John Thorne analyzed the Hall of Fame credentials of hundreds of players and determined that the two way tackles down the Hall of Fame, there's only three of those guys 
on there that are not in. George Christensen uh, from the Lions, if I recall. George Christensen. Uh, George Christensen from the Lions. No, 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 yeah. George Christensen from the Lions, also known as Tarzan. Duke Slater, who we mentioned before, and Al Weistert. Any of those guys, but those are the three guys on that exceptional list of guys like Keith Henry and Ed Haley and Cal Hubbard, uh, Turk Edwards, Bruiser Kennard, Wink Lyman. He's on that list. Al Weistert is on that list. And he is so good that he seems like he's a lock. For, 20, for 2020, and I cannot wait for his induction ceremony. He is easily the best eagle, not in the Hall of Fame. Just, just easily, like, I would say, especially the fact that when he was first team all pro, he was consensus. Mm-hmm. Like, everyone agreed, first team all pro. And yet. I don't really get that that it, much from a tackle. Yeah, and, and it just, just one of those names that just sort of fell off the radar for reasons unknown. Yeah, like, it's sad, but. I, I think it's going to happen. I really think I, it's going to happen. Right. I think you're right. Uh, so, obviously, you well, I'm, maybe not obviously, I'm assuming that Eagle number two won't have the same passion from you. Who, who do we have? Uh, well, uh, talking to a guy that, uh, now, you know how I like Ruben Brown. You know mm-hmm. how I like Walt Sweeney. Yep. What do those guys have in common? They were a nine-time Pro Bowler. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Who else is on that list? That is not a modern era final, but actually in the scene pool. And I've actually heard his name a few times, but I don't think he's going to be in 2020, but uh, might be coming soon. I would say he might be the best linebacker not in the Hall of Fame. He might just be. Matthew Vaughn. Excellent choice. Yeah, and you said that name was coming. Yeah, Matthew Vaughn, he was a great player. Nine time Pro Bowler, two time first team. Five times second team. I mean, if you're a seven time Pro Bowler and a nine time Pro, no, if you're a nine time Pro Bowler and a seven time All Pro, you would say, oh man, that's a first ballot guy easily. Maybe second or third, but he would definitely be in the first three years, no doubt about it. Imagine being a guy like Maxi Bond, having those athletes and not even sniffing, if I if I recall. I don't even think he's even been a finalist. I think you're right. Yeah, he is. He's another name, like another name that just sort of seems to fall off the wayside for reasons unknown, except for like the occasional article here and there. I mean, he was very aggressive, and he was also a very, very fast player. He was quick. He he was good for both the Eagles and the Rams. The reason why I listen him as an Eagle here is because that's where he had um, mm-hmm. more. That, sorry, it, it's where he had most of his career, so I, I listed him as an Eagle. But on the Unrichmond banner, he's going to have listed as both a Eagle and a Ram. So that's why I I listed him as an Eagle. Yeah, no, another excellent choice. Uh, Philly uh, number three. Who we got? But before you say that, I do want to mention that yeah, go ahead. two of those two of those Pro Bowl years that mm-hmm. he had, yep, uh, two of those years, he wasn't even an All Pro. Uh, two, two, sorry, never mind. Uh, I was thinking like you know, two of those. What was it? Uh, n- never mind. Um, I was thinking. I was saying that you know, was two of his Pro Bowl years All Pros? No, it's nine time Pro Bowl and a seven time All Pro. Now, do I have as much passion for him as I do Al Weister? No. No. Because <laughs> you knew that. No. Does that mean now does it, that does that mean he's not deserving? No. I think Max Vaughn is easily he's like top three most wanted linebackers for me. With him and uh Hallie, and I think the third one would probably be like Gratishar. Oh, I would love that. Yeah, I that would, would love that, that would be so good. much. But not before Weister. Not before mm-hmm. Weister. Uh Eagle number three. Um, might be a little bit of an oddball kind of choice, but does make sense uh, mm-hmm. when you think about it. Uh, Pete Rufflap? No, it's not that oddball at all. Hmm. Not well, to me, not anyway. In, well, compared to like you know, the other one that I mentioned, uh, Rufflap, he was a really nice blocker. Mm-hmm. He could play flanker, and he could play tight end. He was a five-time Pro Bowler, and he led the NFL in pass receptions in a uh, 58. Um, now, obviously, it's not as I don't have as much going for him as 
you know, the other two. But he was a four-time All-Pro, and he did win the Burt Bell Award in 65, which essentially is an MVP award that's awarded by the Maxwell Football Club. And I will get to the Burt Bell Award in a little bit, but his number was also retired by the Eagles, too. I think the Burt Bell Award's actually, a, what would you put it, sort of like a right neck and neck with the AP MVP, or? I would listen to it just below. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah, like, it's, it's a, I don't want to say like 1A, 1B, but I mean, it's it's a still a very prestigious award, I think. The Burt Bell Award is very prestigious, but I, I, obviously I'd list that above, obviously below the uh, AP Award, because the oh, AP of course. is de facto. Um, but the Burt Bell Award I'd say that's, that's number two. In mm-hmm. terms of, like, accomplished MVP awards, that, that's a good uh, second one. Um, he also was the um, Eagles VP and GM from 69 to 72. Does that help him, you think? Or not Not at all? Mm, no, I mean, if you're a guy like Tank Younger, it would help you out because you were a great player for the Rams and you were the very first black executive. When your guy like Pete Redstaff, who if I recall was just you know a regular white guy, um, not really, especially when you it's just a short time. Yeah, I don't recall the Eagles being that remarkable in that time frame either. No, they they, they really weren't. Um, but yeah, if you get a Burt Bell Award, especially considering the fact that you were a multi-time All Pro and multi-time Pro Bowler, it's just going to help you out in the long run. Yeah, for sure. All right, Eagle number four. Um, Eagle number four. Um, this guy here, um, his name talks a little bit by, by Eagle fans. Um, Eric Allen. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, very underrated player. Very underrated, very underrated player. Um, Eric Allen, corner, um, six-time Pro Bowler, um, three-time All-Pro. Um, this is a really interesting one. Like he recorded 54 interceptions on 827 yards and eight. Tw- Touchdown, and also got seven fumbles. If I recall, he also, if I recall, I think he had the most amount of interceptions during that time, or like second most, right behind uh, Rod Woodson. And that's pretty good company right there. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, um, he was also pretty good for the team the last few years of his career, where he got a Pro Bowl there. Uh, yes. but, um, we, we don't have enough representation in the hall for New Orleans, but that's another story well, for another time, well, and that's well, going to change. Well, well, I would say that's probably because uh, they sucked for not as many players. <laughs> it's because they sucked for years. You can uh, say it. I'm not offended. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wouldn't get too offended over it. Um, he was very big in the Gang Green defense uh, with uh, Buddy Ryan. Mm-hmm. As uh, that coach, oh, Buddy Ryan, my God, that name takes me back. I rewatched, yeah, uh, I rewatched the Super Bowl Shuffle. I don't know why I did. If you ever want to, you ever want to see bad ball. rap, watch the Super Bowl Shuffle. But that's another story. You might, li- you might hear my, you might me, you might hear me uh, mention that name for the for the list. Buddy Ryan. You might. I'm not sure if I'll put him in there yet. How how big is that list going to be? By the way, uh, we're talking about the non football players. Uh, at least 10, at most 15. I'm making it short and simple right now. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, no worries. Take your time. And so, okay, so after Eric Allen, who do we got? Two quarterbacks. Two quarterbacks. Well, I know who one is right away. Cunningham and McNabb. Okay, yeah. All right, so which one do you want to tackle first? I'd like to talk about Cunningham because... Innovator. I his... Innovator. I would say so, too. He was Michael Vick before Michael Vick. He was a four-time Pro Bowler, four-time All-Pro, led league in pass rating once, and he was MVP by both the NEA in 98, the Pro Football Writers Association in 90, he was a comeback player of the year in 92, and we were talking about the Burt Bell Award. He had three of them. The only other player to have three Burt Bell Awards is Peyton Manning. And that's a first ballot Hall of Famer. People forget just how hard it was. I mean, now it's a little bit different, and it's still hard to for a defensive coordinator to counter when you've got a quarterback who's that good with their legs. But at that time when Cunningham was doing it, there was nobody else doing that. 
not to that level anyway. Like, you know, I, I don't see his name really be mentioned that much. I don't know why. I, I, guess, I think it comes down to the fact that, you know, many, he was inconsistent in some, in some cases. Um, he also had the injury in 91. He also took off in football in 96. Um, he had some injury issues that kind of hurt him near the end of his career. Um, but I would not hold them against him personally because he had almost 5,000 rushing yards. He had almost 30,000 um, mm-hmm. um, passing yards. Uh, I don't know, the fact that he got three Burp L awards and the fact that, you know, he was a very dominant player. Yeah, he only has one playoff win, but who cares? Who cares? I don't, I don't care. But I do want to mention uh, this one, uh, this, this thing, because uh, you hear a lot of people from one side of, of like, the internet mention this a lot. How many black quarterbacks are in the Hall of Fame? One. Warren Moon. Warren Moon. And Warren Moon, go, go, into the, go into that, Warren Moon should have been in the pro in the NFL six years earlier. Yeah. Because he, you know, he had to go to the Edmonton Eskimos for where he won the Grey Cup five years in a row. The reason why I want to mention uh, that that thing is because I uh, see a lot of people, especially on like, you know, more the African-American fan base, that kind of feel a little bit, uh, especially with the whole Kaepernick controversy, they feel a little isolated about it. And uh, they feel like they're, they feel like they're not being represented. They feel like they're being stopped by the system. Like, you know, you only saw one black head coach be hired. And they were pretty mad about it. They want to see more representation, especially for the quarterback position. A business historically been dominated by white men. They want to see their guys in. They want to see a guy like Randall Cunningham that defined the position, got three Burt Bell Awards, was an MVP candidate for a lot of his career. They want to see a guy like that get in because for them, they would see it as a massive victory. And I would say that also would be a big victory for Eagles fans too. Maybe also Vikings fans, but mostly Eagles fans because he was the face of that franchise for many years. So then McNabb's your number six the one man who may have played his way out of the hall of fame, but he gets a really bad rap because he took them oh, to yeah. what four years, is it four years in a row to the NF- N- NFC finals is four or five. I think four. Uh, five times the four in a row. Okay. Uh, with one trip to the super bowl. Uh, if he wins that super bowl, he's, he's at least going to be a finalist, which he's never even been that. He hasn't even been a semifinalist. That's right. No, he hasn't. McNabb no, gets like, you know, absolutely no McNabb love. The, you see far more Eagles fans push for McNabb they do, than they do Cunningham, most likely because McNabb uh, got him, had more had more playoff wins and you know played in the Super Bowl, whereas Cunningham didn't. But I would still choose Cunningham above McNabb because Cunningham really changed the position, whereas McNabb is a little bit of a different story. But I would definitely say what I do not like is just the vitriol and just the hostility that comes at McNabb. I mean, and I don't understand. He led the NFL in wins from 2000 to 2004. And also, what with fourth, just behind Manning, Brady, and Farge. He was a pretty dominant player. He was considered the face of that team. How what people are going to say, like, in the completion percentage. But, you know, people are going to say the wins, and I don't know. Like... He's also the fourth quarterback in NFL history to amass more than 30,000 passing yards, 200 touchdown passes, 3,000 uh, rushing yards, and 20 rushing touchdowns in his career. Three other guys that did that were Frank Darkson, John Elway, and Steve Young. All of them are first style Hall of Famers. McNabb is not. And you know, you're going to see some people say, oh, you got to wonder why. It's like he's black or something. Well, I think there's other factors work, working against him. Uh, Terrell oh, Owens things. throwing him under the bus doesn't help. That yeah, I would say Owens says a lot of things, but I would say that you know obviously the thing that people are going to say is it's a racial issue. They're going to say that I know they are. So why I think it's a racial issue? No, because there's bigger things than just race that's playing to the reason why McNabb's on because if. I think it have a little bit might more have more to do with, with um, Cunningham than it does McNabb, but people really, really want to see another black quarterback get in the Hall of Fame. 
they, they do. And, uh, yeah, McNabb, if Eli gets in, you're going to see a massive uptick for Dom McNabb. And you're going to see, like, oh, they favor the Giants because New York, they favor New York or Philadelphia. They always are out to get us and whatnot. You, you know the story. Mm-hmm. Oh, all too well. All too well. Yeah. And, and like, yeah. guarantee you this, probably in the next 12 months, there'll be three times, maybe four, that I'm going to have to write about some about Donovan McNabb talking about the Hall of Fame again. Guaranteed. You know, I didn't mention his name here because not the six, but there's a guy that mentions about Hall of Fame even more than McNabb, Asante Samuel. He's, yeah, he, he, he's a good one, but you don't get seven. I'm, keep, I'm holding yeah, you at six. I'm, I'm, a guy like him, he says that he wants to be in the Hall of Fame. He does. McNabb says that he gets in, but he said, oh, my bug numbers are better than Troy Aikman. Which is funny because on the internet, they bash Troy Aikman relentlessly for the reason that he just exists. Like, oh, your numbers are only in because you're only in because you have Emmett Smith and uh, Michael Irvin. But yet, when it comes to McNabb, it's just like, oh, we're just going to destroy him relentlessly. And, like, I don't know, like, I would not destroy McNabb. There's a part of me that just feels kind of bad for him, just the fact that, you know, there's just so much blind hatred towards the guy. Uh, I don't like that. I really just don't like that. I'll say this about Aikman uh, before we move on to the, uh, the Redskins. I got no problem with Troy Aikman in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. If he ever becomes in the Broadcaster Hall of Fame, then I'm going to shoot myself because he's he fucking sucks. Well, no, no, Troy Aikman, I'm, I'm happy, but you see, like, again, it comes down to the thing that people just hate on Troy Aikman and Joe Namath and Terry Bradshaw just mindlessly while they pump up guys like Jim Plunkett for some reason, and they hate on guys like McNabb. <laughs> uh, Plunkett's this, make... Plunkett, I can see why people love him. He's just that, he's got that lunch pail uh, work ethic all about him. He looks like somebody I mean, you'd, you'd, go, to, you'd go to work with. And it's not because they're good, because they define the Raider personality. Right. In their exactly. Exactly. Which, you know, we're, we're not conducting guys based on how they show the emotions and personification of a, of a team. We elect them on how they are as a player. Yeah, you can be a guy like that shows the Raider grit, but it's a, a grit of a, of a team member. It doesn't mean you're going to get in. Mm-hmm. Ever. All right. So this, we've got one more team to conclude with, the Washington Redskins. They weren't originally in Washington, D.C. They started off in Boston. A lot of teams move. Is, is that where we're starting with uh, with uh, Washington player number one? Uh, well, yeah, they, they, he would play for a team that, you know, the Redskins were called the Braves, the Boston Braves originally, which was the team of the actual Braves were called in Boston. And, you know, this guy played for a team – that he's also named after a baseball team and, uh, you know, was pretty dominant, but a little bit under the radar, um, I would say. But I would say, you know, if you're on the very first list of the Hall of Very Good, <laughs> I would say when you're on that first ever list, I'm always going to give you a little bit more of attention, even if you're a tiny guy. Pat Fisher. Mm-hmm. Yep. I like that Pat one. Pat Fisher, that's a guy that I... Would love to see him. I don't know why. I think it comes out to the fact that, yeah, even though he only has four All Pros and three Pro Bowls, and only has four, the fact that he was able to do seventeen years at his corner mm-hmm. and and be undersized at that, he played two hundred thirteen NFL games. That was a court. That was a record for a corner. A record. And he was also, despite the fact he was small, he was a great tackler. I mean, you would not expect that from a guy of his stature of five foot nine, but he was. He was just dominant. He was considered the mouth because of his small size. However, unfortunately for um, Fisher, uh, he, he has a he's had a big uh, he has dementia. And, Severe memory loss, and currently he's in a assisted living facility. But yeah, no, that, 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 that's an excellent one, pound for pound. I mean, if you want, if you want to consider that a category, but that that was it was an, an incredible, such an unlikely career for him to have done what he did. Yeah, like it, it, it is under the radar, um, 
But it's an unlikely. Now, do I think he's getting over some other guys? No, but that's okay, because I do think that... He's you know, worth the conversation. Again, yeah, he's definitely a guy in the conversation. Um, I would definitely say, you know, longevity at that position. It's sort of like the whole Jim Marshall. Right? Yes, Jim- totally. I was thinking the same thing. The same the same exact guy was coming up in my head. Like, do you... And also the guy that Browns fans love, Clay Matthews Jr., a little bit differently, though, because Fisher has more all pros. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's similar to the fact that he was much a very, very long stretch of time, and he was always very, very dominant. That is a guy that I always thought, you know, was a very, very unlikely, but yet very, very deserving guy, because, like, no one expected this from him. Mm-hmm. He's just always tiny. You know, how can you do it as a corner? You have to be really big. He's, like, over, like, six foot three. He's like, nope. You do it at five foot nine. He was able to cap guys on a foot taller than him. Absolutely, like such an such an incredible career. Uh, Washington player number two. Uh, you know, we're talking about a guy that had a very long career. Why don't we deal with a guy that had a very short career? Okay. Larry Brown. Larry Brown, yeah. Okay, I like it. Now, as we met, as we know, um, Andrew Luck retired after playing seven years in the NFL, uh, and we've been seeing some people say that you know. He can be considered, and I'm like saying, mm, I don't know, man. I, I doubt it because Andrew Luck only had four um, Pro Bowls and led the league in touchdowns once. He did win comeback player of the year, but uh, unless he comes back, I don't see him making it. But, but I do see a push for him. The guy that I want that had a short career, that actually an eight year career, Larry Brown from the Redskins. He was. Beast. He won MVP in 1972, as well as the Offensive Player of the Year, the NFC Player of the Year, and was the Burpell Award winner. He um, he's not on the 70s All Ducky team, and now he, all the running backs on that list are in. I guess that Larry Brown would be the next guy up, I would assume. Um, but why was his career so short? Well, many injuries. He, this was a guy that had many, many injuries. And he played running back. It's sort of like Alan Amici. He played fullback. That's really tough. Mm-hmm. Another it's short career. Guy like, a, yeah. like saying, like, you know, if Terrell Davis can get in, I'm really happy that Terrell Davis get in. I, I think what yeah. hurts Brown is if they would have won a Super Bowl, if they would have won that against Miami, which, again, that, that would have been pretty hard to beat Miami at that point. But – that would change the narrative on Brown. Does it look like I care about the narrative? <laughs> well. I mean, he, he, never, he never avoided contact. I'm just he, saying these things contact. do matter. Mm-hmm. If, if Terrell Davis doesn't doesn't uh, have a Super Bowl ring, is he in the Hall of Fame right now? Not sure. Yeah, I, I, maybe, maybe. I don't know. Um, can he easily be in the Hall of Fame? I, I, I that that one I don't quite get myself, but that's another story for another day. Though he was the only guy from the '80s that all decade team for the first team that that wasn't in the Hall of Fame. It makes sense. Even. Yeah, I do think he he wasn't that high on my. Well, that doesn't matter. We're not talking about Kenny Easley, but yeah, go on. The reason why Kenny short career guy is because having you know Andrew Luck retired, also left guys like Rob Gronkowski coming up. Also, Patrick Willis is going to be eligible for his first time in 2020. Mm-hmm. I think this really, like, you know, we open up the conversation for, like, you know, Tony Baselli is going to make it probably in 2020. We have guys like that that make it. I, I immediately see, I definitely see a, a bigger acceptance towards guys with a shorter but dominant career. Yep. Well, no, there, there's a case for that. Okay, so now, who, who do you... Who, no. no, well, probably not. Who do you got next? Uh, no. Well, how about we go with a guy that's uh, been a finalist the last few years of his uh, career? Not career. Um, he's been a finalist the last few years um, mm-hmm. until he fell in the senior pool. Joe Jacoby. Jacoby, yep. Yeah, he was a uh, he was a finalist uh, three times. Um, his 18th year of eligibility, his 19th year of eligibility, his 15th year of eligibility, and his 19th year of eligibility, he made it into the top 10. So he was close. But in 15, you had also many other linemen as well. You had Kevin Mawai, you had Steve Hutchinson, you have Alan uh, Fanica, and you also had Tony Baselli. So kind of 
they all canceled each other out, and that's why uh, Toby fell, and now he uh, is in the senior pool. So we're going to have to wait a few years before he's eligible for that. But I think I don't think the, the wait is going to be long for him because, especially when you're top ten, you make it very very close. And you're not in. Usually, people are going to focus on a guy like you. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, it's and the interesting thing with that with that hog offensive line, and he was clearly the second best guy in that, which isn't a shot at him. I mean, they were they were beasts. Those guys, well, literally, they were the hogs. Best, the so, best player on that on that the best player on that line was Ross Grant. Right, but I mean, so that's why I'm saying like he was the number two. So again, this is a line, and he was a part of that for all three of those Super Bowls with three different quarterbacks. None of those quarterbacks, sorry, Joe Theismann, were Hall of Fame caliber. No, I'm not going to mention Joe Theismann. No, I, that's why I didn't think you would. But that that's that says something. That says a hell of a lot. Yeah, I think it says a lot. I, I think it says volumes. All right, so that that's that's I I was positive Jacoby was going to come up. Uh, who do we got next? Um, th- th- this guy, I think. Um, hmm. Oh, no, I, I'm kind of conflicted. Um, how did uh, who is JFK's favorite player? JFK, I have no idea. Gene Brito. Okay, I, I I wouldn't have known that. Would have figured it would yeah, have been I, an Irish guy, but who, I don't remember any big Irish stars for the Redskins. Well, actually, Gene Brito, he was born to a Spanish American father and a Mexican American mother, so yeah, he was Hispanic. I did not um, know that about JFK. Yeah, he was JFK's favorite player. He was a pretty quality player. Um, he was the defensive back for them for the for the Redskins and most of his career. He was a five-time Pro Bowler. He also was a four-time All-Pro. Actually, five-time All-Pro. He took that back. Um, he was also the... Uh, he also was the Player of the Year in, uh, in uh, 1958. Not, not 1958. 1955. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's really, really weird. I think... Um, Gene Brito, 84 consecutive games. With the Redskins. Mm-hmm. Um, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, you can definitely tell I'm not as passionate about Brito. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's okay. But I, I'm just saying that because, you know, James is for a player. I would definitely say that um, what could help him out is the fact that he was a part of the second very good class. But, um, yeah, it was compiled from the Redskins to a common 70 year anniversary of the team, and he was one of four defensive ends. The other ones were Manley, McDowell, and Mann. And, you know, I would mention Brito because he had the, uh, the strongest uh, case. Also, uh, he did die of ALS in uh, 65. So, maybe that's an album, but I doubt it. Um, mm-hmm. All right, Washington number five. I like special teamers. Yes, you I do. probably have you you are a big proponent of special teams players. Very very big proponent. But there's a question I think people question: Who's the greatest return man ever? Does anyone ever question that? Like, who is the greatest return man ever? Well, I think now, a lot of people think say, that's Devin Hester. Some say that, but many people that say like usually if you have the most at something, mm-hmm. and it's a very very important role you should be considered the best one. Because Brian Mitchell is that guy. Okay. One of the one of the just the one of the greatest one of the greatest return specials ever. I would maybe say he's the second greatest behind Hester. But just the greatest. Just what a phenomenal player he was. Fourteen thousand and fourteen return yards. 5,000 punt return yards and 19,013 total return yards. All three of those are big records in terms of oh, I think in terms of all yards, he's only just behind He's only just behind Jerry Rice. And that's rarefied error. If you can just say you're behind Jerry Rice in something, that does mean a whole lot. Of course, now that does not necessarily mean that I'm looking for... Uh, 
Edelman to be, get into the Hall of Fame being second all-time in receiving yards, but that's another story. But yeah, that's yeah. that's one thing though. Uh, I, I really had sort of admired that you, and, and I'll admit I don't look at special teams that much. Uh, but when there's, a, and maybe it's because chances are if you're in the special teams, you're not good enough to be. In, in most cases, that's true um, on the regular off- offense or defense. But true. if you're well, really if you special, play, I mean, it, there is something about it. At Southwestern Louisiana, he was the quarterback, and then when he went to then when he went to the NFL, he became their return specialist and mm-hmm. also a running back. But he's a return man. He was he was just great. Yeah, he absolutely. Was amazing. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, the reason I wanted so much because, like, I would say that the passion for me with Mitchell is probably bigger than that for Fisher because if you're just behind Jerry Rice for total yards. I mean, granted, yeah, he only has three for some other person, but who cares? He has over 5,000 punt return yards and over 14,000 kickoff return yards. I mean, this is like some pretty elite stuff. No, it is elite stuff. No one else has more by a long shot. And in the, in the modern era, it's going to be not near impossible to top. Oh, yeah, especially like, you know how I mentioned how, you know, with safeties, like fullbacks, I was big. On, I'm very big on Mark Alsot. I'm very big on like, um, I'm not big on these uh, positions that people are complaining like you know are worsening. The thing that might lose is like the kickoff. Maybe it's a nice send off for those people that are upset. Putting guys that are big on the return like Steve Tasker and Brian Mitchell and soon Devin Hester, but I think that'd be a great way to do it. Brian Mitchell is. I'm gonna say I think I think he's the best Redskin down the hall of fame. Wow. Yeah, I said it. Wow. I know that's a very, very bold. I mean it's very, very bold compared to Fisher and Jacoby, but I don't know, like just behind Jerry Wright in terms of total yards. Well, that's it's high praise. Very high praise. Very high I have nothing but very high praise yeah, so for I, Mitchell. No, 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 this is gonna feel like sort of uh <sighs> Like a like a calm down almost after this. How do we build? To, how, how can Red, how can Washington Redskin number six live up to what you just did for Redskin number five? How about another guy that's very underrated? All right. This guy started off as a bear, but was that as a Redskin, and he truly became a force. Truly became a force. I I think of this guy as truly one of the most underrated players of his era. Uh, I think of that as Wilbur Marshall. Um, mm-hmm. Easily like three time all pro, well, technically a three time all pro that's just, and technically four time pro bowler, two time Super Bowl champion, a good play, really dominant player for the bears too. Defensive player of the year in 92 linebacker of the year in 93 linebacker of the year in the NFC for two years in a row. Pretty good. I would say, like, you know, he also, his peak was, like, short, but really, really down. Like, a very, just a truly underrated player. In his seasons, he had 45 sacks in 23 phases, which he returned for 304 yards and three touchdowns. He's one of the very few players to record 20 sacks and 20 interceptions in their career. I mean, no, and uh, there's a pretty strong case there, and I think, the amazing thing is here, we've got 24 players that you've just mentioned, all of oh, which yeah. you can make a strong case. I know that people, like you said, would shit on McNabb, uh, perhaps unfairly, perhaps not. Still, if that, that's if you put those 24 in any kind of Hall of Fame, you've got a good Hall of Fame. And it's, it's I, think, I think it's even going to get better, the next one. Oh, go ahead. Guys on here as well, like, I didn't mention any, really the, any active players other than uh, Eli Manning, but... You know, the Redskins also have some good players, like, you know, okay players, you know, like probably the best running back I've ever seen in person than Adrian Peterson. I don't, I'm not going to go into him because everyone knows. Um, I know Trent Williams, which is a little bit dice, but maybe. But as for Wilbur Marshall, he really is one of the most underrated players mm-hmm. of that of the, of the 80s and the 90s. All right, so this is like, good. Do you think these 24 are going to be better or worse than the last 24, because I'm going to hold you to that one too, 
uh, when we get to the NFC North in a few weeks? I think more people would know the names of these guys more than the other ones because when I look at like you know the NFC, a lot of the more player, dominant players a little bit after the time that I really talk about. Whereas when it comes to the NFC North, a lot of those guys are old timers. <laughs> yeah, especially if we're going to come up with six lions. Oh well, don't worry. The lions actually have a have a stronger amount of people than you might think. As long as we get to Mongo, Alex Karras, that's all I need to talk about. Spoiler alert, I'll mention his name. In <laughs> fact, uh, I'm going to mention his name. I'm, don't worry, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to forget him. Uh, and also, uh, a spoiler alert, I'm sorry, but, you know, uh, Charles Rogers will not be on that list. <laughs> uh, I know I know it, it is hard to let us fall, but listen... And also, I know I'm also a little disappointed that, you know, when it comes to coaches, you know, Chip Kelly's also not on this. I'm sorry, guys. And also, Ben McAdoo, I understand, you know, they might have some fans, but, you know, I don't have them all. I just don't think he's Hall of Fame worthy. Okay, I'm, just, I'm done messing with you guys. <laughs> nice. All right, so we'll do this in a few weeks. Yeah, I can't wait. Can't wait for number eight and final one. I can't wait for it. All right, love it. Thanks, Vinny. Anytime, Kirk. Anytime. All right, later.